Welcome back again to Perspectives on Empathy. I am your host, Taylor Brown, and we're here today to talk about empathy and leadership with one of our very own Longhorn leaders. Today's guest has been an ardent supporter of the Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation since I arrived in summer 2017. He has been an ever-present positive force at our programs and events, and in the process, we've become close friends. Dr. Sunit Singh is an assistant professor at the Dell Medical School Department of Surgery and Perioperative Care. He teaches courses in leadership and clinical skills, and he's also a motorsports physician at the Circuit of the Americas. Sunit, so, it's always a pleasure when we get together. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Taylor. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as you said, uh, I absolutely love what uh, you guys are doing at CSLI. It's been an honor and a privilege to have played even a small part in it. And uh, I can't thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's good to have you, Sunit. It's always a pleasure. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Um, sure. Doctors and nurses, nurses have really been on the front line of this pandemic um, since we first saw it come to America in force in around um, mid-March. So can you just give me a little bit of uh, insight as, as to what your experience has been like? Yeah, you know, I mean, to take me to that takes you through the whole gamut of emotions, right? Initially, we hear this virus, right, coronavirus. And as many people have become accustomed to this virus now just through social media, the news, their own personal experiences or experiences with family, you know, coronavirus has been around forever. Coronavirus is actually one of the viruses that causes the common cold. But what makes this different is it has mutated and has created a novel strain. So when we first heard that it was in China, you know, it kind of got your attention. We had no idea that we were on the verge of a global pandemic that was about to impact truly every single country in the world to the degree it has now. And so it was a matter of, oh, well, that's, that, that, that's interesting. And, and boy, that sounds uh, like they're really going through a lot. And my heart really feels for them. And that's really what most of us on the front lines here in America felt. But then slowly you heard about the number of lives it affected. And then it started growing from city to city to more countries. And that's when you first had the insight into this is unlike most infections that we see, right? I mean, we are accustomed to um, diseases such as SARS and MERS that grew to other countries and became a global pandemic. And very slowly as weeks turned to months, we realized that we were um, probably headed that way again. And then sure enough, time confirmed that's exactly what happened. And then it hits the country, right? Initially, it's in um, that so you hear about a, a, a story in a nursing home out in the Midwest, uh, California, New York. And that's when it really starts to hit home that we really need to make sure that our emergency preparedness plans are in order. And everything that you hear, PPE, right? How many times has this country now heard the letters PPE, personal protective equipment? How many times have we now become accustomed to talking about respirators, right, N95, something that you could pick up at a, at a uh, department store or, or like a home goods store, which, you know, it, it's, it's funny to think like that's how readily prevalent it had been because so many industries need it. And now all of a sudden it comes to the forefront of the medical profession needs it. And now all this PPE and respirators, gowns, gloves are in short supply. And initially as a, as a frontline provider, it goes from a disease of curiosity, wow, I wonder what's happening with it, to you immediately jump into, I need to learn as much uh, about this disease uh, as quickly as possible with whatever information is disseminated out there. I need to know how does it look different than the common cold that its predecessors, the coronaviruses, had created? How does it look different than the flu? How does it look different than seasonal allergies? How am I going to differentiate this breathing abnormality from just run-of-the-mill asthma or pneumonia? Um, and so you really you start to jump in while trying to manage the 
overall emotions of, wow, this is really hitting our community. And what does this mean in terms of me and my living situation with my family? If I'm going to be on the front lines, I'm indirectly bringing them in. And every single doctor, nurse, uh, technician, uh, you know, it, it takes so much to make the healthcare lines work. Your registration clerks, your cleaning crews, you know, the, the, the people in the supply chain industry who bring you your supplies. It just, it touches everybody, right? And so ultimately, you go from curiosity to deeply jumping into the medical aspect of what is this going to look like and what kind of care do I need to deliver? And all the while, you have to deal with your own internal emotions, your, your fears, your uncertainties, um, your, your hopes, your ambitions. Uh, what does this mean for my children's future? Uh, so that's kind of like, like a little, maybe a little longer than I would have expected for your quick insight, but very complex uh, question, and I, and I really appreciate you asking it. Sure, and, and how are you doing with all that? You know, you know, you have your good days and you have your bad days. Uh, there are, there are initially there were times when you sit back and you feel like you've been prepared, and you're still waiting for that patient zero to arrive at your own institution, right? You know it's in your, you know it's in the country then you know it's in the region, then you know it's in the state, you know it's coming. And you, and you ask yourself, when that patient arrives, it's not gonna be as pretty as we've drawn up, right? They're not going to arrive in the ambulance with the paramedics already aware of it as well, and they're in their gowns, and you're in your gowns, and you have your room pristine and waiting. Um, no, the patient arrives, right? And the patient arrives and, and, and they take you by surprise, they come into your triage area. And so how do you take it? You take, you take it as like, oh, wow, here it is. Like, oh, wow, are we prepared? Oh, wait, is the room ready? Um, and so it, it goes, once again, how am I taking it? It goes from a position of, I feel like I'm prepared. Uh, I try to be prepared in everything I do in my life, whether it's my personal life or my business life, um, or professional life, really. And there are fears. There, there. You do hope that you you're doing right for the patient. You hope you're doing right for the patient's families and their friends and their contacts. And you hope you're doing the same for your own staff and coworkers and for your families. And ultimately, when I do start to feel, you know, a little trepidation, a little concern, that am I doing this the right way? Um, I I like to step back and think, well, I've prepared myself for this. This isn't me just kind of jumping in. And so I have to take comfort in that I have put my due diligence into a process that I've been part of creating. Sure. So I'm doing okay. Sure. You mentioned feeling like you're doing the right thing for your patients and your family and your coworkers. Um, you know, there, you, you have a lot of relationships that, that you really cultivate in your profession. Um, you know, as a, as a professor and as a doctor and as a father, um, you know, what is the role of empathy um, with these different people, these different relationships that, that you're working with um, from your patients to your students, uh, your coworkers, um, even, even your responsibility to the general public as a medical professional? Um, where, where does empathy fall into that for you? Well, the, the first place I'm going to have to answer this question is this is once again one thing that will always be very near and dear to me where I really want to thank the CSLI and you personally for what you've done in my life. You have helped me um, reflect on this way before coronavirus was ever a thing. And you, you, you have allowed me to, to think about what does it mean to be who I want to be in life? How do I want to be a better father, a better, a better son, um, a better husband, a better parent, a better friend, a better clinician, a better teacher? And empathy is absolutely at the core of all communication relationships. And so you, you said a word that, that strikes me in a very near and dear fashion 
that I hope one day people will talk of me and say that he used this word a lot, and that's responsibility. What is my responsibility to my patients and their families in my community? You know, a community is as large as you define it to be. And my responsibility is to sit back and think about all the individuals that get impacted, right? You know, what the patient needs is similar to what a student, because I, I do teach medical students and medical residents what they need. You know, the patient needs care. The students and the residents need to be able to learn how to deliver care under proper supervision from an attending, such as myself. But then we step back and we think about uh, the institution, such as uh, the, the medical school, who is responsible for the safety of these learners. And so from a medical school standpoint, they want their learners to create, to, to have these experiences to help take care of patients, but they also want to keep them out of harm's ways. And so to talk about empathy, you really have to sit back and think about how different uh, people need different things out of the same experience. And if you don't allow yourself the ability to sit back and reflect and to really try to think about what does it mean to be in their headspace right now? What does it mean to try to walk through this experience from their point of view, right? Everything has to be 360, right? Um, uh, without empathy, you're really just gonna come across a lot of frustration and anger and, and misunderstanding, and that's going to indirectly affect every other relationship from there. So empathy at the end of the day has to be at the core of my communication with, with as many people as possible who represent everybody with their own individual needs, but the community's needs. Sure, sure. And, and you mentioned in your teaching of medical students, you teach a course on leadership. And I'm wondering when you introduce a concept like empathy to medical students, how do you introduce it in a way that is less transactional and more transformational in terms of relationships? Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a good one. Actually, uh, and 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 so through through the years, I've I've also found that. I can't be part of this great university without wanting to reach out to the undergrads as well. And I've had the privilege of um, also having these conversations with um, the, the pre-med students who are actually involved in the Texas Athletics pre-health organization. And we have this exact same conversation. And the first thing I have to think about is this is the the the, the most excited group who is willing to jump into this unknown uh, medical climate that we're in right now. Um, we, we, we hear about the tragedies, we hear about the triumphs, and we ha hear about uh, kids uh, and, and undergraduate kids who are, who are now medical students uh, as they transition into young adulthood, into residency, and to really make it a, a, an experience that's meaningful I try to always relate back to the fact that we don't take care of patients. We take care of people. These are people with their own individual stories. Um, this is not just uh, Mr. Smith in room 10. This is, this is John Smith. He is a carpenter by trade. He has a wife. He has two kids. Um, and he's coming in and he's scared. And I have to start off with the individual experience to really make it something meaningful to people. And I always try to, 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 to bring it to something meaningful to yourself. And even though hopefully not all of your listeners have had a direct personal experience with coronavirus, we have all had feelings in our life of sadness, concern, fear, hope, we have all had our ups and our all, we've all had downs, unfortunately, but we've all learned how we can grow from it. And so to really make it a transactional experience with, uh, with anybody who I'm blessed with teaching, I try to talk about those core human emotions and experiences and then try to relate it with 
individual that who we are caring for sure. and experiences that I've had that I try to share with my students. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as we move into a time when more and more states are lifting quarantines and loosening regulations, um, we're seeing a lot of different responses to this from different groups of people. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I remember, uh, just this past weekend going and seeing, you know, full bars and, um, you know, people yeah. out on paddle boards and giant groups. And there was, there was a lot of gathering going on, um, hugging, connecting, doing things that humans love doing. Um, but then there are also uh, those folks who are taking a much more cautious approach and, and staying at home, um, you know, abiding by the, the social distancing, keeping the masks on, in some cases, keeping the gloves on. Um, we're all approaching this differently right now, but how can we um, practice empathy for those people who might be on the other end of the spectrum? Um, practice empathy for those maybe we don't agree with or those we think are putting other people in danger. Um, how do we approach that? Oh man. Uh, once again, you're filling million dollar questions, which is why I always enjoy uh, going out with you after hours also just kind of talking about life and, uh, and, and the beauty of it and the simplicity of it and the complexities of it. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think the, the, at the core of the question is how do we relate with people of a different point of view? And it has to come from a position of understanding, right? It has to come from a position of love. It cannot come from a position of uh, an adversarial relationship. You know, the first thing is we have to find it within ourselves to, and this, this is something I say almost like a, a, a broken record. We have to learn to listen to understand, not learn to listen to respond, you know? Everybody's experiences brings them to their own set of core values. And it is absolutely incorrect in my eyes to think that there is only one set of values that makes sense. Uh, I think back to my own undergrad days in psychology class when we talked about morals and we have somebody who steals from a marketplace and is that okay? And everybody says no. And then you kind of learn about the story of the thief trying to feed their family um, then you're like, well, now is it okay? And then all of a sudden, some of the class comes around and says, oh, well, in the greater context, yes, it's okay. And still, you have your people who say, well, no, stealing is still wrong. Uh, I, I, I liken what's going on right now as people are re entering into society. There's some who are going to be ready for it, and there are some who are not. And as long as we can try to understand the other person's point of view, I think we're going to be okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're a leader in our community, Sunit. You, you lead students, um, you lead your department, uh, your coworkers. Um, what advice do you have uh, moving forward? You know, as we, as we hopefully start to make our way out of this, um, but there's still, you know, a lot of uncertainty. You know, people are talking about the second wave and some states are still in the first wave and we don't really know how long this is going to last. Um, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a really tiny one that we can't really see that well. So, right. so what advice do you have for leaders, you know, moving, moving out of this or continuing to move through this? You know, let me, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up from the medical sense. And, and, and I think that's kind of where I try to, to stop to really kind of, think about other people's point of views to, to offer my own. Now, when coronavirus first uh, kind of hit the, the global scale and, and kept going from country to country and then hit our country, and we, we heard about this notion of flattening the curve, right? How do we flatten the curve? These, these, this, this isn't a term that I'd ever heard of in my life. I, at the end of the day, uh, in my business life, uh, I'm a clinician. Uh, I work in the emergency department. I, I don't work on epidemiological scales. I didn't know what flatten the curve meant. And, and ultimately what I've come to appreciate is 
if society had not have been as gracious as they were to have taken the extreme measures of shutting down to the degree it did. And I know how much it has uh, impacted people and, and honestly, in, in a mental health standpoint, very negatively in some ways. Um, it, 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 it's very as close to altruistic as possible what society has done to allow us to be ready. And that's what we did. Can I make the overall numbers of people affected go down? Well, I hope so to a certain degree because everybody has been home quarantined. But more than that, we really gave every state, every city, every organization their ability to come up with their emergency preparedness plan. They gave us the ability to talk about how are we going to try to get the PPE that I talk of. And if we don't, what's going to be our secondary uh, steps? And then what's our tertiary steps if we can't do that? Um, how are we going to empty out the hospital to be ready for people to come in? Uh, so many people were, were impacted by having surgeries delayed. I'm talking about people, not necessarily the surgeons, but of course them too, and then everybody's families. We are, we're, 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 we're in a much better position. We all have our plans. We all have greater communication channels within uh, our own networks and then moving across state lines and across the whole country and beyond. We are in a much better position to open up society. And that takes us to your question, which is we have to open up society eventually, right? And ultimately, there's a, there's a term called analysis paralysis where you can sit there and you can analyze the situation and you can continue to analyze the situation. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but ultimately you have to be able to say, we're probably going to be as good as a position in any right now to make a decision. And you're going to have somebody who'll say, well, we might be in a better position next week. And that's not wrong, but ultimately you have to have a consensus that it's, it's, we are ready to make a decision. And the, the decision that our leaders have said, we can open up society now. I'm going to put my faith in the people who we have asked to make these decisions. And I will do my part to make it as successful as possible. So as I ask our community leaders to talk to their constituents of, of, of the fears of the unknown and is it okay, I want to say we're not rushing to any decisions here. We've all sat back. We've all had our own private conversations in public conversations. We as a, as a society are in a good position to be as successful as possible together. And so as we re-enter into society, just remember we're in it together. This has not been by any means a, a, a rash decision. Awesome. Sunit, thank you so much for your thoughts and insights. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Again, you being here today, it's always a pleasure when we get together. Um, oh, yeah. Do you have anything more to add to everybody? Boy, uh, I just once again want to say uh, how much I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you again, Tay, uh, Taylor. Um, uh, I, I have to reiterate once again how much I personally learned how to be a better uh, person. I'm not even going to say teacher, physician, educator. I, I learned to be a better person being around you. Um, and that's why when, when you asked me to be part of this today, um, that, that was a no-brainer. It was actually the most flattering thing I think I could have gotten in my life, to be honest with you. To be here today, to be uh, your guest, um, really has a deeply meaningful impact to me. I want to thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sunit. And uh, I guess we'll leave it off with uh, hook and horns. Absolutely, baby. Yeah. <laughs>